So welcome to this side meeting. This is uh, a meeting about Flex Ethernet. Um, first of all, <laughs> I owe a favor to the Mitico team for providing support for remote participation for a non-official meeting. This is my way to say thanks to them. And uh, let's start. Not well. Even if this is not an official meeting, we are uh, covered by the ITF not well. So everything you say is going to be recorded. Everything you say is going to be considered as uh, an ITF contribution. Please uh, speak to the mic. Since we have uh, uh, a formal working group arrangement, let's make use of that. What's the purpose of this meeting? So first of all, to allow for a tutorial-like discussion on Flexi. We will have uh, uh, very interesting uh, contributions from uh, various uh, Flexi uh, experts that uh, will, uh, uh, will help us understand more about this technology. Then uh, the idea is to have uh, an, uh, uh, an open discussion on what the ITF may or may not do in this context. Uh, as you know, we already started working on that in uh, in SICAM, but uh, uh, the scope of this work could be uh, could be a little bit broader because we are starting to introduce uh, uh, client side awareness in the network. This is something that in GMPLS, for example, we we never done. So this is a good opportunity to start working on this, possibly making this work uh, broader than just the technology specific. See, th this is why we wanted to involve also TEs, uh, PCE, and uh, other working groups that might be interested in this uh, widening of the Flexi uh, context. And then uh, possibly uh, the, 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 the output of this meeting is to put together some inputs that can be used by the chairs of existing working groups and AD to take some decisions and possibly uh, schedule some work. Agenda, pretty, uh, uh, as we said, we're going to have a presentation from Aumian on uh, Flexi background uh, and origins, on, uh, and then uh, a uh, deep dive on the technology from, uh, from Iptica, and finally, what uh, the ATF can do uh, and is doing uh, uh, regarding Flexi from, uh, from Mac. And then an open discussion that uh, uh, hopefully will lead us uh, to the famous inputs that we are speaking about. Let's start uh, with the first one. It's uh, Aumian. Okay, uh, good evening everyone, this is Hamia. I'm going to introduce some of the background and basic knowledge about the Flexi Internet, including some uh, existing works on the data plane from other uh, standard organizations and some kind of uh, requirement and use case we have in our current ITF work. And uh, uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to give a brief introduction on what is the FlexE. Actually, the FlexE uh, provides a mechanism to support uh, a variety of uh, uh, Ethernet MAC rates. And this kind of uh, MAC may or may not correspond to any ex uh, existing rate. It means it can either be uh, integral mu multiple or, or, or non-integral multiples. So currently the data plane uh, recommendation has been defined in both IEEE uh, and the OIF. So we have some reference here. We have some reference here and uh, the OIF has completed its work as Flexi 1.0 and uh, this is used as an implementation agreement. And uh, for corresponding control plane, work, we are assumed to do it in CCAM working group. 
currently there is already a draft uh, talking about the framework of the Flexi uh, technique. And uh, we also plan to deliver the uh, corresponding protocol extension for the Flexi. And there are together uh, some correlated uh, uh, techniques related to flex Ethernet, like uh, the PCE, the young model, the segment routing, and some uh, bandwidth on demand, flex C, something like that. We can also consider the use case and uh, uh, make the draft in different uh, working groups. So the flex Ethernet proposed actually uh, a high level requirement to support a kind of files. And this kind of files can either be a bonding of Ethernet file, saying that uh, it can be an uh, M by 100 giga, or a kind of subrates, which means less than 100 giga file. And they can also be a kind of combination, like a, a, a uh, we call this a channelization within a file to say uh, within a different uh, separate and uh, combine it together within a single file or even we can allow the hybrid of the above three cases to be uh, carried in the same channel. So <clears throat> this is a figure on how the, the, the Ethernet files are bounded. And here we would like to introduce three very uh, important terminologies in the flex Ethernet literature. So the first one we're going to show is the, the Flexi group. So this is uh, 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 a Flexi group is uh, composed by uh, multiple Ethernet files, say from one to 254. So, Currently, this is the first version of the OIF Flexi, and uh, oh, it may change, but uh, it may change in the, in the future version. And the second term we would like to say is uh, the Flexi client, and this is an uh, Ethernet flow based on that data rate. So, <clears throat> the last one is Flexi scheme, and this is uh, the, pl uh, the place where the mapping and the demapping of the Flexi clients happen. And so it uh, provides a bridge between the uh, Flexi client and the uh, Flexi group. And after the terminology, we would like to introduce the three typical use cases for Flexi, including the Flexi unaware transport, Flexi termination in transport, and the Flexi aware transport. So we start from the Flexi unaware uh, scenario. In this case, the transport network itself is not aware of the uh, Flexi Ethernet and consider it as the normal kind of signal type. And in this case, the Flexi scheme need to uh, map the client over a group of bounded Ethernet files. So all the files here uh, is uh, grouped it by the by the by the stream, and they are carried independently, but usually uh, over the same fiber route over the transport network. And uh, the 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 disk room across the transport network is uh, done on the flexi stream. So this is uh, just the uh, uh, the the transport network is. Uh, not aware of the existence of the Flexi signal and uh, just uh, uh, use it for, for, for transportation. And the second case is uh, Flexi termination in the transport network. And in this case, the transport network uh, uh, is aware of this kind of Flexi Ethernet signal and uh, the Flexi group is assumed to be terminated uh, on the transport network equipment. So we can have <clears throat> different kind of rate in the, uh, after the demapping from uh, Flexi Shim here. We can have a kind of sub wavelengths or uh, 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 multiple 
uh, size, and this is uh, three times 100 giga, and this is uh, something in, the, in between. So we can uh, we can we can uh, cho choose for, uh, choose we, can, we will have plenty of degree of freedom to choose the the, the uh, sub wavelengths we have. And it can either be a kind of wavelength or sub wavelength over here, here. And each of the green line here is a kind of 100 giga and is a uh, representative, representing the, the phi information. And uh, this can be a, a kind of uh, 50 giga plus 150 giga. And uh, 50 giga goes to here. And we find the 50 giga here, and 150 giga uh, comes to this one. So uh, the left node will have a corresponding 150 giga. And similarly, there are 25 giga, and uh, between this node and this node. So, <clears throat> so in total, we can see this one have 175 giga, and it need two two files to carry it. And the same, uh, the same as the previous one, this also requires two different files. And for this one, we only have 75 giga, and we need one file to carry this. So usually the flexi group here is terminated before crossing the, the, the transport net, uh, network by the flexi scheme. So the total screw is usually uh, comparable to the Ethernet PCS. And uh, considering about the application, we, uh, according to the OIF implementation agreement, the distance that restricted, uh, the, the flex is restricted is usually uh, 40 kilometers. And the last scenario we are going to have is uh, the flexi Ethernet aware transport. So in this case, the transport network is also aware of the flexi, but uh, uh, different with the previous use case, it does not terminate the, the, the service. <clears throat> so this can be used in two different scenarios. The first scenario is when the wavelength is less than the Ethernet fire rate saying that if this is, uh, this is not 100 giga, if it's a 75 giga, we need to use this mode. Or there is not an um, integral multiple of fire rate, say, say 150, something like that. So we need to uh, use this kind of mode to flex the aware transport to operate. And uh, there are also some uh, implementation considerations. So for example, when the card is is not able to, to terminate, but it can still support the flexi uh, signal as an interface. So uh, in this case, all the files, uh, again, need to be carried uh, independently, but over the same fiber route over the transport network. And in this case, the disk group is uh, also performed in the flexi scheme, so like the flex, flexi unaware. Uh, as well as case. So the only difference is the difference of rate and the work done in the flat machine. So uh, the flat group here are configured so that uh, here is uh, we, uh, in order to carry 150 giga, we also need to uh, use up to two different files, which is a total of 200 giga. That means uh, we only use 75% uh, of the, the calendar slot on each file to carry the client. And uh, we also need to uh, give specially uh, consideration on the mapping and remapping for the uh, slots uh, distribution. We need to allocate the the slot of the, the transport network to carry the corresponding uh, flexi groups. So that is the case of the flexi aware transport. 
And uh, I think that is all for my introduction about the faculty background and the basic information. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what is uh, Flex C Ethernet? I think so, uh, how many uh, introduced? So basically, it is a mechanism to allow different client rates, you know, client rates which are beyond, for example, 100 G, you know, any multiple of 25 G rates to be supported without uh, having corresponding file at the same rate. So by grouping a bunch of 100 gig files, right now the Flexi uh, Ethernet agreement has only defined bonding or grouping of the 100 gig Ethernet files. In the future, they are planning to also allow 200 gig or maybe the other one. So by by grouping 100 gig files, for example, you can create a pipes and then actually support client rates smaller rate or higher rate. And so you don't have to wait for the, the corresponding big files to be developed. So you can do, you know, uh, if the client is available to trans, you know, to ship that amount of data, you can support that way to uh, bonding of the uh, flexi. Uh, uh, so up to right now, the, currently the spec is defining up to 254 uh, 250, uh, a 1 to 254 uh, uh, files can be grouped, but I guess in the actual practical application, probably 4 to 8 is going to be more realistic scenario for, for, the, for the short term. Uh, and so the flexi, uh, the group which is bonded together is it's called the flexi group, and this is a mechanism which the Flexi Ethernet uh, framework uses to actually provide the decoupling between the uh, file rates and the client rates. So let's look at some of the examples, the tutorial examples. So on the top, we, we have Flexi group. So in this group, we have two, uh, two members. So 200 gig uh, rate. So I can, uh, this is showing uh, a, a 200 gig uh, client in this case, being supported. The next one is showing actually uh, a, what is called a super rate. I, because I have 150 gig pack rate, I'm supporting over using 100 gig files, two of them. And then I can also do what is called the channelization. Uh, uh, channelization means within the same group, I actually have multiple rates. Uh, then I have uh, the, I'm showing also within a single file, you can do channelization with a group of files or with even with a single file, okay? So basically it just shows that by grouping, just like uh, very similar to the concept of lag in Ethernet, you can actually uh, create a higher aggregate bandwidth and then support different uh, client rates. But currently, uh, the configuration supported by the Flexi is M by 25G, 10G, 40G, or M by 25G clients. Oh, thank you. Uh, do I need to announce myself? Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, sure. no, I, I'm, I'm just <laughs> asking about the procedure. You know, that I'm, uh, uh, Greg Mirsky, ZT. So you mentioned um, channelization and that could be within one PHY or across uh, multiple PHYs. Yes can be that the channel takes phi and a little bit of another phi. Yes, uh, very, very good question. Actually, have a slide out. Okay, about great, that. thank you. Perfect. Yeah, so 
uh, just just wait uh, maybe maybe two slides down we'll talk about this the scheduler and then I think we'll touch upon that question okay so here's this showing example just comparing uh, the, so the on top is shown the uh, the uh, standard Ethernet stack what it, you know five what it looks like and so the max uh, so the flexi actually is introducing a, a shim layer between so the from PCS downward actually is what the standard 100 gigabytes. So and then there's a shim layer, which is doing a bunch of multiplexing, demulet mapping, and scheduling. All those functions are done in that layer. And then you have the MAC layer. So each client, as, as you can see, so so this is how the decoupling you achieve, right? So I can have files of 100 gig, and by grouping them, I can create a bigger file, and the clients I can support it, you know, of any corresponding way. So. So in this example, what we're showing is uh, we have shown a client, right? So this Flexi group have N files grouped together. So this is showing the max direction. Of course, similar to the DMX direction, I, I'm not talking about. So. Yeah, OK. So uh, client one, for example, client one comes in. And then uh, so the clock rate of the client and the flex C domain, there, there's some differences. So in order to match the clock, so actually there's some, you might need to actually insert. Insert or remove some of the, uh, the idle cells to match the rates. Once that is done, uh, the, the, the corresponding bits are actually spread over uh, the aggregate rate, we will talk about that in, in, in a while. And so as you can see, a lot of the functionality is happening in the flexi must. So this is how the, the decoupling between the phi and the client rate is achieved in the flexi. Any questions here? So for example, here I'm also showing like if one of the clients fails in the DMX direction, what you will do is for that client, you will just send a, a line fault signal for only for that client. In the reverse direction, however, if there was a failure in one of the five in the group, you will be sending LF on all the clients. I am, I'm not showing that one in the reverse direction like that. Okay? Okay, so here is the question I think uh, Greg, you were asking, right? So, so what happens is each five, okay, so the basic, a time slot or granularity defined the flexi with five gigs. So each hundred gig, it corresponds to twenty-five gig slots. So if I have n five, so corresponding to that, there's a logically there is a calendar size of twenty times n slots. Okay. So if I have a if I have a client, for example, which uh, okay for whatever reason it could be more than hundred gig or Maybe it's there some client before that which is occupying some of the slots. So in that case, uh, let's say I take example of 50 gig. So I will need 10 slots. So maybe five can come on the first five. The second five could be on the second one, or maybe the third one, depending on the current occupancy of the, uh, of the calendar. So uh, the mapping between the client to the calendar ha happens as a part of adding the client. So that, that's where maybe this potentially, I think, the Mac will talk about it. Maybe some signaling uh, coordination might be needed to coordinate what, what clients I'm adding or removing. As you actually add a client or remove a client, this needs to be indicated to the other, the deep. So if this is a max direction, and the DMAX corresponding DMAX need to know which client is using what kind of so in, in the map. And the logically grouping number identification actually is uh, is the same on the between max and min. Uh, well, Wilton, just a, a clarifying question. Actually, your previous slide you said that when the transport files uh, went down, is it all clients get notified it's down, or all clients be carried on that particular? Uh, in the reverse direction. Uh, okay, in this direction only if the client is failing. So the client, so suppose this client was mapped to uh, uh, slot number 10 to 20, suppose. 
one of five. So in that, those time slots, you just send the line, you just saying uh, in those time slots, you're sending LF. Okay. But in the reverse direction, if one of the five had failed, then you indicate to all the clients. So is that, uh, this is how the spec. That's what the spec is expecting uh, about. I think I guess reverse direction because you don't need you, you uh, only reason I'm saying it why they're identifying them because this could be affecting any client. They don't have a brochure of who to send it. Uh, on on the much direction, I know which client is failing and I know what the, what time slot I'm using and. You so you don't know. You don't know. You can't uh, I, I, I guess the, some knowledge should exist, but I, but the spec is the way they spec me out is they notifying all the clients. Okay. Yeah. But maybe we can dig, okay, maybe uh, can look further, find out why they're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe there's some uh, flexi expert in o on the OIF who has participated. Maybe can they uh, can help us answer that question. Sorry? Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so so this is how the calendar mechanism works. Basically, you have uh, a calendar mechanism is working. Sorry. Uh, here, right? So uh, every time you're adding a uh, calendar, you need to add it. Uh, you need to assign what, what calendar you, uh, slot you're going to map it and then indicate it to the, uh, the remote end. And I'll show some example later on. For example, this coordination needs to happen between MUX and DMUX. Okay, so this is a lot of detail here, but this is showing, this. so there's some overhead bytes, in-band overhead bytes defined. So these overhead bytes are carrying a bunch of information, but, but the, the important information I want to point out is, as you can see, there's a five map. It shows how many, which file number is part of the current group, file number, like logical number to identify the file. And also they have a concept of calendars. Uh, uh, basically, okay, what is the current map in the calendar which is I'm using? And so let's say uh, at the at time zero, I have no clients. Okay, I add a client, and so I can indicate that so uh, through client uh, calendar A, I say okay, I'm adding client number one, and okay, these are the time slot I'm using. Okay, and then so you will indicate in a calendar A client calendar A, the remote side will acknowledge it. It needs to wait for the acknowledgement before actually activating those. Uh, those time slots. Now, at time T1, another client comes in, or you want to maybe change the size of this calendar, uh, you know, client, you know, from 10 gig to 15 gig or 20 gig. So in that case, uh, so you have a, so right now the, our, our current calendar was calendar A. So in that case, what you will do is you will use calendar B. You say, okay, this is the thing, a change I like to make. So. This is basically to change the configuration with calendar B. And then you send a request. The DMAX will respond. If it's acknowledged, then you make a switch. Then activate those clients. And there's also a management channel. So for example, there could be use cases where uh, you have a satellite node. For example, you don't have a management accessibility, so you can use actually in-band communication mechanisms to, to manage the remote end. But if you have access on the both end, this is optional. You don't need to use this uh, communication channel. Uh, Rob, well, another quick question. When you change the calendar, is there a traffic loss at that point? Uh, when you change the calendar, uh, I, I, I think resizing what, so this would come under resizing, I guess. So. The spec is saying is they are not expecting a hit less. They are not expecting a hit less resize. Okay. So there could be uh, a glitch. Yeah. Okay.
Uh, okay, so as you can see, so this is uh, essentially a, just a quick summary of some of the information. This information is sent on each file, and there's a multi-frame structure, so every, there was a number here, every on top, so every 20 times 20, uh, 10, 23 flexi data blocks, this whole thing is repeated in each file. So every like few millisecond, you get this information periodically, deterministic, you know, the TDM like uh, on the other end. So you can, uh, so uh, Mux and DMUX, they can monitor this one and then see what's happening in terms of the client use, uh, sorry, uh, calendar usage or how the clients are being added or removed or so forth. Okay, so I think, I, so now we are ready to, I think we have all the essential background for this one, so I'm just showing here a simple example. So simple use case is, uh, I think, uh, how many showed uh, flexi termination use case? So basically, you have a router on the, like, A and the router one, and the router two, for example. They are directly connected, no transport network in between. So in this case, uh, for example, uh, I want to, uh, this is showing an example how I would go about this one. So I, for example, on the AN, I program uh, the, uh, the uh, time slots and into the calendar, which is an art use, and I send a request in the in-band communication uh, overhead, uh, and then start a timer. Okay, as for this, you know, how long the timer, I think yeah, it's left out to the implementation, there's no, probably, Implementation, I have to figure it out. I you know probably in the order of you know two million, maybe less than short, you know, and maybe configurable timer. Uh, and then the other end will, in the CA bit, in that overhead byte, it will say, okay, yes, I'm ready. And and if you receive this acknowledgement before the timer expires, you go ahead and make a switch. The switch could be a new, adding a new client or resizing a new client. If you don't receive it, then within the time or, uh, before, uh, then you say, okay, you actually back out of this request for making a change, and you notify based on your local policy. You know, you know, it's alarm or say, okay, I'm bailing out of this request. Okay, so this was the case. Uh, now, the second one case is okay. Uh, now we have a transport network in between, like unaware case. As you can see, nothing changes from the interaction point of view. Okay, as far as the, this interaction is identical to the previous case, it's just that I have the transport network in between. So it's identical. So it's okay, uh, Okay, so here I'm just showing one, I mean, there are multiple use cases. I, I'm not touching for all the use cases, just some of them select use cases. So here we are showing the unaware case. So um, when you say it's a transport network, Kiran, uh, but you said it's a transport network, so flex e header is still carried over the transport. Yes, yes, so, exactly. Can yes, you say? yes, yes. So, if see, if this is unaware case. If it's unaware case, so these ellipses I'm showing a n and z n. So the flex e termination. So, for example, if I'm going left to right, okay. Uh, so the flex e shim is terminated uh, across. So the overhead is carried over in this case. Yeah. There is some other cases, partial aware, so where the partial termination happened on the first node. I'm not, I'm not showing that, but yeah, there's some use cases where, yeah. Hi, this is good. Um, just to, uh, to point out, the, the, the AN and the CN, is that supposed to be a piece of equipment in your drawing? Or what exactly? It, it is. It is. A, it is a piece of equipment. This could be, for example, if it's a flexi unaware case, it will be most likely a router. So the way I was looking at it is uh, the a, what you call A and C and this uh, kind of round circles over there. It looks to me like a trans, like normal transponder, uh, with uh, um, let's say it's several wavelengths. 
and you get in uh, let's say a lot of let's say different clients you know, add up which uh, yeah, I, nothing to do with the router I, I, I guess no packet processing yeah I guess it's basically as far as the transport is concerned I mean transport mean like for example OTN pipe or okay they are unaware about the fact what is being carried over so in from that sense Yes, it could be trans any device which is implementing flex -ition. It could be any device, yeah. Say, the thing that I find confusing mm -hmm. is typically when you, uh, when you think about a WDM network and a, let's say a classical transponder-based WDM network. So I would say that is flex -E aware because the endpoint A and C are transponders and they are aware that they're doing flex -E because this is where they are. However, in your scenario, it's called uh, non-aware, so that's a little bit confusing. Um, take uh, it as a comment. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, no, true, true. I'm saying is so. Yeah, so here's my understanding and my uh, interpretation. So I'm saying is any device. I guess it's implementation, right? So one scenario could be. So which which device is implementing the flexition? So in this case, it could be a router. Okay, right? Router, and then I have a transport box which is just providing a transport, so it's unaware. It doesn't know what is being carried. You're just going to set up a pipe, like I uh, have an example later on, show it. Uh, or it could be a transponder, or I guess uh, transponder. So in that case, the, uh, I guess transponder you, is a flexi, obviously flexi, it's doing flexi shim. Yeah, and then, so you, in that, yeah, so, uh, no, the terminology, they are, this is the terminology coming from the uh, OIF, uh, sorry, yeah, implementation agreement. So we're just sticking with that. That's what they call it. Anytime a Flexi client is carried over a, a, its own file of uh, individual files that carry over transport network. So, for example, let's say I have a three files. Okay. Each file, I set up a transport connection. For example, ODU4 or whatever, right? So in this, I'm setting up three, three connections. Yes. So that connection, it doesn't, so it, it's fixed. It doesn't know what is being carried. It's not interpreting, for example, flexi, overhead bytes, and so forth. So what they call is unaware case. Yeah, I guess in that sense, it's, uh, yeah. So. So, uh, you're on current. So, so the uh, unaware case means that no one in between the A and C shall not kind of terminate the 6460C decoding. That has to be end to end between the A and C. Yes. Okay. So, for example, all the, uh, in this case, I'm showing three lines. They could be three files, right? 300 gig files. So, if it's a 300 gig files, each file, I will carry it in a separate, if it's OTN network, I will have three separate connections. I will just, like, I think PCS code would transfer in some terminal, right? I will just carry it across. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's not clear, so kind of just like how it's presented here, like now, it's like uh, if you think that your transport network has some box in between, yeah, yeah. that terminates and then continues, then it cannot be yes. an aware box. So that's kind of yes. But if you uh, just have a lambda going, yes, I yeah, I think the uh, the reason for that is because I think uh, Howen showed some of the use cases which actually uh, I thought conveyed that meaning. But I I have actually example here. Maybe this will show it. Okay, here if you should look at this example. So in this example, we okay, so in this example, client shim two files for each file. Okay, so this is where the transport network is starting. Okay, now this could be in a transponder. Okay, implementation. So if I'm here, I'm carrying that file in audio 4. This and this is one connection. This is this is another connection. And then they go over here, they are start they're terminated over here, and then the flexi shim is terminated there, and then I get my client out and then there. So uh, Yes. Back, back, forward, back. 
Yeah, that one. Um, so just these, these messages at the bottom, if I'm unknown to that. Um, if, uh, if the uh, knowledge doesn't come in in time, is that because there's like a programming delay, or could it be that the message got lost? So is there any concept of lost messages? <coughs> I do. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, good question. Good question. I'm just. I'm just thinking. Uh, I don't. I. I didn't. I mean, it doesn't feel to me that there should be. I mean, apart from implementation bugs, so where it's lost uh, after it's been received. But so the the delay, the fact that it's not come before the timer is because. It could be, yeah, so first of all, I think, in the best of my knowledge, there is no, yeah, there's no concept of the, uh, loss, because periodically you're sending it. Yeah. Uh, I guess through repetition, I guess you're taking care well, of the... If you can lose it once. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I hear you. Um, I've lost my car keys more than once. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, if the reason it hasn't, if the reason it hasn't been responded in time is because the switch, the the, the switch request didn't get through, or because the switch knowledge didn't get through, it really yeah. does kind of change the yeah. well, could be bit. could be multiple reasons. One of the reasons could be I'm just theorizing, okay, is that um, on the receive side maybe, the C processing is taken, but I think uh, this is this is supposed to happen in the, mostly with the hardware assist, so I wouldn't expect too much delay, I mean once the once the frame from the, you know, from the, you have the, those bits, maybe this extra processing delay the software yeah. on the C side, that could be uh, uh, an issue. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's what I interpret from yes. I, either there's, there's some serious bugs, or that's what I interpret from the figure. Yes, yes, that that is my understanding. So classically, if we wish to be paranoid about these things, we send the pack, we send the um, uh, update over a few times, a small number of times, but a few times, uh, just in case one of them goes astray. Yes. Yeah, so here, the repetition is happening every multi-frame. So I, I'm saying just yeah, they're repeating it, just like a. So they are kind of repeating it, but I think there's no notion of explicit notion of loss. In that. Okay. Yeah. okay, so this was the unaware case, right? So unaware case, we had a transport network in the middle, and we, we went over that. Uh, hopefully, I think there was a question. I, I think uh, here. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think okay. Uh, uh, it's not clear that the transport network and how, in the unaware case, each phi is independently you know, carried over. And I think one of the requirements in the OIF spec they're saying is that they need to be routed, phi's needs to be co-routed to address some of your questions. Actually, maybe the delay should be similar. It's not like, you know, if one is going, you know, through scenic route, route right? And then there's a lot of delay, and then this will call the problem. So they need to go out with the same, hopefully, same fiber. Okay, so the flexi termination case. So in the flexi termination case, uh, the, uh, the basically the first half node, let's say I take an example of an implementation example. Okay, a router to the first transport network device. So it's, it's terminated right there. So it's like a lag. I mean, like, like you were just directly connected. In that case, the advantage is the following, right? In the unaware case, obviously, as we touched upon, the disadvantage would be the delay. So the delay and the skew and jitter, you know, has to be absorbed by the A and Z end. So if there's a lot of delay, then the ASIC or the, the, the device needs to compensate for the delay. And obviously, maybe limiting how far you can go. Right? In this case, the limitation is removed because you just within a very close, short distance. 
And so you don't have to design your a, a system for that higher delay compensation. That's number one. Number two, it allows you, over there it was nailed up. Everything is like a bookended, okay, from going from A to B. Now here you have the ability, once I terminate, the client is extracted, I can put it in different lanes. I can just read out it which, you know, where I want. So ability to switch, I guess, terminate and then go different ways. Uh, that's the way to do it. While Gert uh, gets the mic, uh, one question from my side. Why is this uh, Flexi terminated? It doesn't seem to be terminated uh, in the in the, in the graph. That, yeah, that is the, uh, so termination means, yeah, it is terminated actually, right? First half, you terminated, as far as the Flex E is concerned, Max and Dmax, they kind of are stopped here. So, but it, it, yeah. it means that the shim is terminated yes. on A, and doesn't go through the optical network. Yes. So this means exactly. So if uh, if it's a, a uh, exactly. So the outer one, and so in this example, okay. So shim is over here, and shim is over here. Yeah. So if I'm going max, uh, like max to D max in this direction, for example, so the client will come here. I, I'm maxing the client into the uh, to flexi. Here they are D max. The client is out, like end clients, and now I can pack them in different uh, SNCs over the over the uh, over the transfer net, right? So they stop here. So it's just between uh, up to here only. That's it. In the other case, but if they are transported independently, how can Z put them back together? Uh, it doesn't. doesn't be, no, so it's just stopped here. It now, basically, in this case. It's independent. So I, I have Flexi Group over here. Uh, somewhere, somewhere across the network, I can have another uh, another one. They could be completely different sizes. In other words, I have a Flexi uh, Group here. It's unidirectional. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, let's make it simple. I mean, the, in the unaware thing, the, the client, which is the only identity matter, has a little bit of a buffer to kind of align the lines. And there's the assumption that all the lanes travel on the same let's say on a piece of fiber, not more than 40 kilometers. I mean, there were some, some assumptions on um, how much skew they need to compensate, and that is obviously limited. Now, what you're saying here is if you have an extended range and you want to rot your wavelengths, assuming there would be wavelengths in the middle, or in a different direction, yes. obviously you need much, much more buffer. I mean, we're talking about 100 gigabit in times to compensate for any kind of, uh, of delay, and that would be need to be swallowed by those middle boxes where it's called. Yeah. Or, uh, the, the yeah. But, um, so essentially, yet yeah, technically, if you need to go a very different way and you want to go east and west, this is the way to do it. Um, let the market decide how economically feasible that is given all the buffer you need to compensate in time for it. This yeah, this is, in, yeah, exactly. It will depend on use case in the market, but I, exactly, this is, yeah, yeah. I'm, this is more likely, in my mind, to be deployed, but it's up, <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So I have a question not related to this, but is there a limited amount of clients a flex internet group can, can get? Uh, is, um, I have to check if there is any, because, okay, so each client, uh, they have a, I, I think they have a 16-bit field, if I remember. It's I have to check. I think it will be large, but uh, I Thank maybe you. some limitation, because each client, as you're mapping, you actually, yeah, yeah, you're identifying, there's, a, there's an ID for a client. I think the 16-bit field is a quite large. Can be twice as yeah, yeah, I think we have to check, I, that's what I, I remember. There's like 16-bit field which is identifying each client. So I think this was huge. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
Good, good evening. Uh, this is Mark. Uh, so I'm going to give an introduction to the uh, Flexi Linear Work in IK. Um, uh, Min and uh, if you can has, uh, has already given a uh, detailed introduction to the background with chases and the uh, requirements uh, for Flexi. So, so before starting to talk about the future plan, uh, um, let's have a look at the uh, data plan. Uh, here, uh, I, I will introduce several uh, flexi related uh, terms that we've used in a, a flexi interface. The first one is uh, flexi interface. Uh, if you can still remember, uh, just as we introduced in uh, uh, presentation, uh, a flexi can support uh, bounding and uh, generalization. So a flexi interface is actually a logical bounded interface that consists of uh, one to uh, 254 uh, 100 different interfaces. And also, a, a flexi interface can be uh, channelized into multiple uh, sub interfaces. So, a flexi link uh, that uh, a link that connects two flexi interfaces is called flexi link. You can see that a big part in the, in the below figure, a green one. And also, uh, a link that connects two uh, flexi sub interfaces is called uh, flexi sub link. So the small uh, parts in the, in the figure, you can see that. So here's our. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 just a question for uh, okay. question clarification here. Uh, my, my, my name is Yuji, and uh, this is new terminology defined in the slide, not in OIS. Flexi I write, such as a Flexi interface or a sublink or something like this. This is new terminology, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, here's an overview of the Flexi Kito Um As we know that, the current Flexi is current defined as an interface technology. Um, uh, in order to, uh, you can see that that's a flexi interface can be considered as a new type of uh, either interface. To make use of uh, uh, flexi interfaces, uh, just as using other type of interfaces, uh, some interval power con are extensively related, for example, uh, to distribute, uh, collect the flexi uh, link state information, uh, IPP render extension, uh, extensions may be needed to support uh, sync learning and uh, end-to-end flexi pass, um, either sync routing generated or RCT uh, related uh, extension may be needed. Also, if you want to uh, synchronize computation, uh, for example, you know, PCE, uh, PSET extensions may be needed as well. So we can do that uh, to support a kind of uh, mechanisms uh, there may be need more, need several, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of the uh, case is made is related to uh, several protocols and across, across uh, several groups. So here's a high level of this uh, like the architecture. Uh, um, this picture is trying to describe the relevant parts of the uh, that see data plan and the uh, plan and their relationships. Uh, the bottom part, the flexi data plan, is a fundamental part that is defined in, uh, currently is defined in OIF, and of course this part is out of scope, in the scope of ICAF. Also, um, the state of the data plan is reflected and distributed by the flexi uh, link state distribution and collection part, and this. This part is normally uh, implemented by IDP or BTT centers. And those information is fed, in, is fed to the uh, single, single learning part or the path computation part. And those parts can use the information to control the path. And according to the demands from the policy or operation or management part. So uh, the legend in the right side. Uh, List uh, the potential home of each part. We can see that, for example, the GMPs can be 
based work uh, should belong in a CCM keyboard. And uh, the IDP binary part, maybe in, maybe, uh, maybe in, maybe either in CCM or IDP binary keyboards. And the Sigma in binary should be in, uh, should be, should be in the CCM keyboards. So, okay. So here is a here is an example how to show that how uh, RCP can be used to single of end to end that he pass. Uh, here we list two options, there may be more. Uh, the option one, um, that he, uh pass is just a control plan representation. Uh, they allocate slots uh, to the pass are concatenated through the RPT signaling. And uh, when transmit traffic, there's uh, no empty label on the, on the wire. And uh, the forwarding at each part uh, is based on the uh, stop matching table. And uh, in option two, option two is used to, uh, is to establish a normal uh, MTS airspace and um, do traffic and zero, the bandwidth uh, it's not to corresponding uh, that it's not for example if you want if you if, if, if you want to uh, establish a uh, 10 gigabit RSP then there will be two that it's not will be allocated to this RSP because uh, one sort is only happy um, so again okay, at uh, uh, some question for clarification again at uh, in this picture uh, where, uh, uh, how many, and uh, where uh, does the uh, quick sim exist? Uh, per, per routers or end to end sim? Or, so my question is, how many sims show in this area? And, uh, yeah. yeah. Every hop. Yeah, every hop. Yeah. So, every hop. So that uh, every so every router at uh, uh, quick sim is terminated, and the, so in my understanding, if my understanding is correct, flex e pass LSP means it's client uh, flex e client, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since at uh, <laughs> this right new terminology is shown, and uh, I'm a little confused, and <laughs> maybe. Uh, I think, yeah, up to one is like just like OTM, like they no, just just use the RP signal to you know, to calculate the relevant um but it's not at each part at each part. But the package transmit is based on the you know the mapping between slots. I don't necessarily need to use the antistable to to forward in package. But for the second part uh, the second on the output two it just uh, establish um, uh, just like uh, RK over the uh, factory and uh, it just use um, for this case uh, the RK uh, the bandwidth there, there, there's a mapping between the bandwidth and uh, the required bandwidth between uh, between the bandwidth and the okay you are you fix Flex E slot means and the flex E client in OIF document, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can see, you can you can see, consider that there are space of uh, flex E client. Um, so in, in option two, mm -hmm. are you using you're you're proposing to use an MPLS label on the wire? Mm -hmm. Okay. How is well, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how that's encoded and, and, and treated, but maybe you're, you, if you've got that on a, another slide, tell me to stop. I think that RSP is, is established by, uh, in a normal way. The only difference is that in a, in a traditional way, of RSP is allocated a uh, uh, bandwidth. There's no mapping between the RSP layer and they lower the year. But right. in the office, if you have to mapping between the 
fan base and the other layer that you saw. For example, we wanted to uh, to establish a thinking bit RSK, then there will be two time uh sort flex dot binary to this flex ERT. Right. And then when you actually get a packet, you'll look at the label and do what yeah, with that and label? do a mapping to the relevant flex sort and and, and transmit the packet through the snort. Oh. It's it's a it's a switching at the lower layer index for information at the higher. Layer. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, one of the things which is uh, I think a little bit misleading here on, on the slide as well is um, at, in the previous slide we saw that there are several client interfaces getting into uh, uh, the MUX basically. So, and here it exits directly from the router. So, you're, let's see, if these wavelengths, for example, you have directly the interface, the wavelength interface on that router or box, whatever the box is. So, why should it use uh, Flexi anyway? Internally, I mean, it, it's, I, I understand the use case where you say, okay, I have a, a Flexi node like a router and I hand it over to some other box, one of the two. That's, it. That's fine. But now everything is in, in one box, so why do I need to get another a second step um, in order to get out of Flex E if the interface is already there? I mean, I mean directly is the sub interface. Right? The sub interface, yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah, that's the first one. First, the optimal, 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 optimal. Yeah, but, but in terms of use case, I mean, assume you have four sub interfaces, right? So at hundred feet, so they need, are hosted on that piece of hardware, which is called R. <laughs> so now, uh, typically, let's say what I would expect from a router to say, okay, I do whatever is needed inside the router, but I don't care what exactly it is because I need to pay for those four interfaces. So, what is now the advantage of using a, um, let's say, a Flex E versus, let's say, directly for a native interface? It's a question. But, um, yeah, you can think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my interpretation on that. So, I guess number one assumption you're saying here is that at each hub, Flexi for whatever use case you have in mind, right? And so that, given that, so I guess the advantage could be conceivably is, okay, by Flexi, you're getting a bigger pipe than what you would get otherwise, because, right? We do, otherwise, we don't get the bigger pipe, right? And then, I guess at each, at each hub, I have the ability to do switching and maxi. In other words, I think maybe not shown here, there could be other client who could be entering the pipe and then some leaving. So like each hub, like it's like envision like switching is happening in a pipe. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> let's assume if, if all of those pipes would be a single 100 gig interface, just for example. So this is exactly what you do in a switching box. You get a lot of traffic coming in. You max them together and send them out on your interface. Does it mean that in case of MPLS, uh, you terminate the, 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 the MPLS LSP at each hub? Yeah. If you say you switch it to the Flexi layer. I, I, I even don't get it with switching because I'm not sure if switching is the right term here. Because in, <laughs> because in, the, in, the, in the end, what, 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 is, what this is doing is uh, inverse multiplexing. You get in with a packet stream. You do an inverse multiplexing in n times five gigabit slots and you shoot it over the line, whatever it is made up, 
and you do another inverse multiplexing in the, in the end. So it's like PPP, which has two modes, right? Packet mode and inverse multiplexing mode. It's CDM based on 5G slots. My comment, is, uh, mix, uh, not, uh, my comment here is basically if it's a router, you should, I don't see how option one will work. Because you, 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 you yeah. start. You mean? I saw you basically start to, to identify a completely new coding paradigm if you, if you do it option one in the router. In the transport device, it's a different uh, discussion, I think. But on the router, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, uh, like a, like it's a completely new coding paradigm you actually introduce. So, option one is very challenging, I think, uh, like on the router. Well, hmm. I think that's a good, with a DMPLS point of view. Uh, I'm interpreting RGPT to be the DMPLS version of RGPT. Um, could probably say, okay, we did with Sonnet, uh, we had this uh, 155 or 140 megabit slots. Uh, okay, that is Sonnet++, plus plus, and now we have 5 gig slots. Um, I think it, it's going to be the kind of the same thing. Um, not sure if, if it's a good idea, but at least this is what I got um, in the way it is working. Uh, so Sonnet++ plus plus with 5 gig slots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This here is a example of a shows how factory can be used with signal mounting. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. As we know that the current uh and here space signal mounting cannot uh do bandwidth uh better vision. Um but but for some cases the bandwidth reservation and the resource isolation are a critical requirement. So with uh, this uh, factory canonization, uh, uh, it can size the you know the factory interface into you know small pipes and uh, allocate. Uh, the pipes to different um, use case, uh, uh, different uh, clients. Then we, we use this way. But we, even we don't have the RCP signaling, we can do bandwidth uh, reservation, and also can provide a better uh, resource uh, isolation. The, but this is nothing new compared to. Option number two in the previous slide applied to set my routing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Do with Sigma uh, RCP or with either with uh, RT or Sigma routing. Yeah, here's um, about the next may, day. May, may, one question for me too. So what if actually there's a hole? I mean, there's not flexi all over the place. Like there's a non-flexi, uh, I think flexible routing probably can address it, but just, just wondering, what, how would you, just, have you thought about it? Like, you know, here, you're assuming the entire is a homogeneous network. Mm -hmm. Everybody is coding flexi, right? Yeah. I mean, realistically, I mean, even for deployment, probably you can have an increment. Let, let's say we go with this approach, right? So, what if there's a hole in the middle? Like, in other words, there's a flexi, and then there's a non flexi, and then there's a flexi. Uh, so, how would yeah. any, how could yeah, I think technically can do that? Yeah, that, no, if 
there is two segments, one expecting space, uh, another one is still IPO, IPO, the performance example. In that, in, in that segment, IP or IP segment, cannot guarantee the bandwidth. Mark. There's no... Mark. Okay, so speaking the mic, they cannot hear you remotely. Okay. So, the, in, that, in, this, in that segment, the, the resources are shared by multiple uh, clients. So you can do that, but it's not better than, it's not, there's not good editor. So for now, the current, there's a team working on the framework documents. The, the content includes the use cases, requirement, architecture, and solutions. And the next stage, we are working on the RCT, signaling, the routing extensions, and PCA, Sir, this is much under So, what are the TV parameters uh, you are seeking to extend? Actually, in IGPs, for example, what are the TV parameters you are thinking? The slots, or what is it like? You know, the bandwidth. What traffic engineering parameters you are seeing? No, I, I didn't get your question. Sorry. Sure. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so. What parameters do we need to add to the TE advertisement? Yeah, that's right. yeah. Is it just bandwidth or slot? Bandwidth, or? slot. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about protection? I mean, is, is there any kind of uh, one plus one protection defined going to be defined? Um, well, the, well, it's a question. So, uh, is there a protection defined for a let's say segment or a group? Um, yes. I mean, if it is supposed to let's say be something similar. With switching capability, it's kind of a natural extension. I would say that if it is supported by the data plane, we need to have extensions for uh, RSVPT to signal it, uh, for uh, OEM uh, to manage the, the, the switching, uh, young model to do the configuration. Exactly. So I, I'm just missing it here at, at, at a point. If it is not present, fine. Um, but Now, uh, if I use the OEM as a source, right? I think they haven't defined it. It doesn't mean it's not the current, current version. I think it's not addressed. Uh, Greg Mirsky, ZT. Um, what, um, what is the scope of OEM? <laughs> no, okay, or let me rephrase. What uh, functions OEM you you see that are needed here and ITF can contribute because uh, again uh, I already mentioned that if okay I'm trying to map it to compare it to Sonnet SDH so Sonnet SDH with transport had its own OEM which was embedded in a header of the envelope yeah uh, honestly I think okay so yeah. uh, are we saying that there will be some OEM which is not native to Flex E encapsulation? Yeah, probably. Okay, uh, then sign in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this for now this is kind of potential work for this you know, Flex E. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, be yeah, when glad you know, to just think about it. For think you. about it. Yeah. There's a, a piece of work that you, you have to add to the list if you do option two, mm -hmm. uh, and probably if you do the segment routing, which is that you're changing or you're adding a new meaning to an MPLS label, right? Because um, you're not doing a label swap, you're doing a, uh, a switching lookup instruction. Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. not. It depends on how many RSP you want to yeah. establish. And for now, uh, you know, 
the, based on the current uh, flexi definition, the a flexi interface can only consist of one max to uh, 255 uh, interfaces. And uh, um, for each kind, the, the, the bandwidth for each kind, the, the, the limit, um, how's it, limit one is 10 gigabits. So there were not too much space. So there were not too much empty space. Um, yeah, I, I, I get that. But the, the instructions, so when you receive a packet with a label, mm -hmm. that label tells you what to do in the flex E layer, yeah. not in the MPLS layer. So you don't, at the moment, when you get a packet with a label, the only thing you can do is in the MPLS layer. Mm -hmm. So you're changing or you're adding a new meaning to a label, which is fine. And Stuart's probably here to say, yes, yes, we're doing that. Um, <laughs> You, you may well have to do a swap, but it's not. That's what happens in the MPLS layer. But you're also using the label to inform what you do in the Flex E layer. But and that's an additional thing, an additional semantic, and and that's fine. It's just it's a piece of work to put in the list. But why did you say it's just for segment routing? It, it, no, it's I said it's for option two and probably for segment routing. Ah, well. okay. It applies also to RSVPT. Yeah, yeah. Um, does it apply to no the RSVPTE one? I think what you're doing is actually because um, there's no label on the wire. Yeah, so option option one, there's there's no label on the wire, and you're effectively cross connecting at the flex whatever that means at the no, flex C no. layer. Um, for option two, and for the second routing, you're Per packet programming the forward in action in the flexi layer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in my understanding, in the current uh, implementation of butter, I think such kind of work has already done by the uh, implementations. You no, know? it's just like uh, when you receive a label mapping, you will you will take a look up to find the output interface. But now, this kind of work is done, is, is, is done by the thing on the protocol. But in the past, that is a local process. Just use a local table to find out which, which interface in the, is the output interface. Right. We're, we're kind of worrying about this, but this is kind of you know, just part of ordinary business, right? We observe that we need to do it, and um, we'll write a definition when the time comes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a big deal. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, just one comment. Agent comment remind me that uh, because original GMPS uh, LSP stack uh, mapping to the same wise of all the system to the same wise. But now we have. Sometimes we have two layers of optical layer. One client layer is the flexible payload. Then the second layer you have the mapping to OBU payload. So some so if we consider those two layers, sometimes we need to consider the uh, label set in GMP GMP stem. It depends on in the middle known how you add or sort the traffic in the flexible label or level or through the audio level. There are two levels. Okay. Uh, from, uh, again. Yeah, so the, the way I look at this is like if, I, if I'm a router, right, the additional capability which I have to deal with is the, the client, at the client level, I have to use this ID as a bandwidth management for that sub-interface kind of thing. Right? That's how I look at it. For an optical or a transport gear, you can do uh, two things in my view. I, because the flex ID, you don't necessarily have to use a label to simulate, but the flex ID can be used as a cross-connect identifier to map your traffic to whatever else. So I think depending on 
the equipment you look at, I think you it's a you get a different perspective of this. Yeah. But that means that if you would use option one in a transport gear, you would actually have a flex Ethernet switch, or you s start switching based on the flex E ID which you map to the client, mm -hmm. and that's something completely new which is not existing right now. I think we have ODU based switching, but this would be something new. Uh, which you would have to... Actually, you could have a router also in the middle of the network. Yeah, okay, but in, I, then I'm talking back to the router uh, here because then you actually hand it off to the router. But if you really want to, if if the picture which you showed before is actually a, a transport platform with no routing capabilities, mm -hmm. you actually have to map based on the flexi connection ID or whatever. I, I don't know whether I use the right terminology, but Based on that, you actually have to do the switching to the proper uh, either new flex Ethernet channel or uh, ODU, whatever. Uh, yeah. You need to be able to terminate an MPLS label, understand what it means, if do Ethernet switching, and then a remapping. Yes, I, that's you, what you can do today on a transport gear. But you could even look at a more optimized implementation where you avoid that stuff and actually use the ID directly to do the switching without looking at the L LSP layer, so you don't have to have packet uh, capabilities into your gear. Am I making myself clear? I point. There's good again. Uh, so the, the whole thing uh, reminds me a little bit to um, what we what we had in, in Sonnet times. There was a fixed concatenation, which basically meant that you need to to route a set of time slots always adjacent to the network, which would fit, I think, to your first uh, use case, where is it, okay, I've got four audio containers which need to go in parallel. Uh, then there was uh, flexible con concatenation, uh, where you basically have the ability to route each connection separately. And I think there was a more recent thing about the ODU flex, uh, with resizing and everything, so that also came in. Um, so I think we have at least three kind of predecessors, at least in VMPLS CCAM, uh, which could basically be kind of used in order to model that water uh, does as well. Um, so it doesn't seem to be too foreign in terms of modeling. Um, again, whether it's a good thing to do or not, that's another question. I uh, just uh, Dennis here. Um, um, from what I understood, the, the use of the flex E in the, in the SUPT case and the Sigma routing is to actually provide the capability on having, uh, say, an aggregated link, so you can actually resize the, uh, the bandwidth. Uh, but then, who will do the uh, the resizing? I mean, the orchestration of that, the configuration, and also the configuration of the multiplexer and the multiplexer. Do you have any? Proposal on uh, on how this could be done and uh, whether this could be done in IT. I think you can use no as as the, in a previous slide you can do use the young model to configure that. You can you can also use the PCA PSAP to can to configure. And this is already uh, say an, an activity when you uh, achieve. It. Yeah, I think there need some pre-configurations on how to, um, you know, to configure the sublink, the sub interfaces. If you want to use the sigma uh, routing, basically. Last question from my side. You 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 use the two references. One is OIF, OIF, the other one is IEEE. What comes from my OIF or what comes from my Tripoli? Because I'm thinking in terms of liaisons uh, and so on and so forth, standard data plane uh, and so on. Yeah, in my, in my personal understanding, I think most of the practice application has come from OIF. And we just reduce the PubMed file information in that way. So I have say 100 gig Ethernet standard from the standard IEEE, 
I think flexi, I think, is the OIF definition. Okay. We are perfectly in time. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thank, uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for teaching us, for contributing with your comments. And uh, we're looking forward to see, to see the drafts that you promised uh, in, the, in the next steps. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but